hope you have your Bible with you. I want you to turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We started last week a uh, verse-by-verse study in 1 Thessalonians. We'll also be doing 2 Thessalonians. They kind of go hand-in-hand together. Uh, Very, very important that we know these. Uh, These are uh, two books that you don't hear a lot about except for certain sections of them. But uh, God has given them to us, and every word of God is pure. And so, therefore, we want to go through it in a faithful, consistent, verse-by-verse way. I've entitled this today, The Impact of My Life. Now, if you have ever uh, poured concrete or seen concrete poured before, such as a sidewalk or something like that, particularly when it's around a home, uh, they're doing maybe a new walkway up to the front door or something like this, and and then that uh, cement is poured and then occasionally what they will decide to do is they'll, they'll decide to say, well, you know what? Uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and put our hands in it, okay? And so there's that freshly poured concrete, and then they put the handprints in or the footprints into the wet cement, okay? And once that is in there and it dries, folks, there's no undoing anything, okay? The, the prints have been put there, and they're a matter now of history. Now, uh, If new people come to that home or that sidewalk, they may not know whose footprints or handprints those are in the cement, but they know somebody was there. And you know, that's really, it's kind of like life itself for us. We are uh, are conceived, we are born into this world, we live a life, and one day we die, or we look forward to the rapture uh, today, of course, Uh, the Lord coming back and and changing us instead of us going through death. But nevertheless, most people people will die in that regard. And the question is this, what kind of prints have you left in the cement of this world? What kind of prints are there? What kind of evidence has there been or is there that you have been here? Have you made a mark of any kind? in the world. Many years ago, I, I uh, thought of this, and I, and, I, and I couldn't help but remember it as I was preparing this week, and it's a saying that goes this way, live your life for something that will outlast it. That is really, if you want to come to the end of your life and you want to know, have I lived a worthwhile life? It is live your life for something that will outlast it. Have we lived our lives for that which is eternal? Those values that are eternal values. That is what God wants for us. Now, we see here in 1 Thessalonians, we covered the first half of the chapter last week. Today we're going to cover the last half of chapter 1. But we see here in the text that there was something way bigger than the here and now. Okay? Everybody's getting all pumped up about, you know, the Super Bowl's coming, and you see the people, and, and we were out running a few errands yesterday, and I was looking at some of the shopping carts that people have, and of course, you know, uh, particularly if they're male, uh, they're loaded with pizzas, loaded with pizzas, and that kind of food, you know, the junk food, it's kind of like Super Bowl Sunday is the Sunday to where you can pull out all the stops, you can gorge yourself, eat anything you want, and, and uh, you know, no, no guilt will be charged to your account kind of an idea. That's, that's where we are as a, as a society. Why am I telling you that? I just lost, I just, I just forgot the, the, the reason I was telling you that. Anyways, but the, the point is, the point is this. God wants us to be thinking in terms of, when it comes to him, he wants us to be thinking in terms of, oh, I remember what it was, what's truly valuable, okay? Now, I'm not against football, uh, sports, and so forth. I love baseball, and the other sports are fine. But the point, though, is this. Let me ask you a question today. Do you get as excited about Jesus Christ as you do about the Super Bowl? or about your sports team, whoever that sports team may be. Now, friend, if we don't get excited about the Lord, 
then there's really, it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with him. There's something wrong with us. Because he is the most exciting thing in all this universe. His ways in Christianity and the message and the life that God has for us as believers is the most exciting thing of all. Live your life for something that will outlast it. 1 Thessalonians 1, we're just going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, Paul and Silvanus, also called uh, Silas, and Timotheus, Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give, thee, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Now that verse 4, it's, it's a simple statement simply recognizing or referring their, to their salvation. All right? And now it is clear in the context of this chapter and in the book that their lives backed up the message they believed. Okay, In other words, they, they said they believed something, and then their lives were showing the reality of that. Now, don't confuse this with simply living a life of good works. Okay, uh, This was the, the proper fruit that should come from a believer's life, somebody who has trusted Christ as Savior. Good works won't get you to heaven. But God wants us, once we've trusted Christ the Savior, to live a life that is dedicated to Jesus Christ, okay? The, the uh, Thessalonian believers, well, Paul recognized God's working in their lives, and they were following the will of God uh, for their lives, and really they were following the will of God for everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. It is simply the plan of God for his children, this following, the will of God, it was, wasn't a requirement to getting saved. It wasn't a requirement to staying saved. It wasn't proof, okay, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, or it, let me put it this way, it wasn't proving that they were saved, because how do you really prove that? But yet at the same time, what we can do is we can manifest and agree with God's ways and then follow the plan of God for our lives. Now, Paul recognized it, and in their lives, they had uh, made a mark, handprints in the cement. They had already, even though they were young Christians, they had made a mark for the cause of Christ, okay? Understand again, salvation is not by the way you live your life. I know, you know, Maybe you're here today and you have this preconceived idea that, well, okay, you know, I'm going to go to church. That certainly is not going to hurt my chances as far as getting to heaven. Well, it's not going to hurt your chances, but it's not going to help your chances, friend, because we're not saved by good works. Now, I wish everybody came to church every Sunday, okay? I wish every believer in St. Cloud, Minnesota came to our church every Sunday, but there are believers out there who are what I call Christians at large. Okay, I'm not saying they're large Christians. I'm saying they're Christians at large. Who they're saved, and yet at the same time, they don't go to church. They're really not very interested in spiritual things. Now, people say, well, well, then are they really saved? Well, if they've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, yes, they are. Should they be manifesting the eternal life in them by the way they live? Yes, they should. But you see, the two are separate. Let me show you this. Hold your place here and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, a few pages to your left. Going backwards, it would be Colossians, then Philippians, and then Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, it tells us how we are saved, how we are saved from hell to heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, not of works, lest any man should boast. You notice how we're saved? We're saved by God's grace. What is that? That's God's unmerited kindness and favor towards us. 
It's not something we deserve. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we qualify for by our good works. We are saved by God's grace through faith. Faith in what? In Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins and paid for them on the cross and rose from the grave three days later. And when you put your faith in him that he did that for you, he saves you, he delivers you once and for all by his grace. You notice it's not of our works. It says in that, not of yourselves. And then it says it is the gift of God. Oh, friend, listen. Going to heaven is a gift. Do you see that in the verse? It's a gift. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can deserve. Gifts are free. Free. You know what free means? It means free. It means it doesn't mean if you buy one, you get another one for free, which is not getting anything for free. It's getting two for 50% off. Do we get that? Free means... It's offered to you, you merely receive it. If you say, well, what's the catch? The giver says, there is no catch. It's free. You mean it's, a, it's really a gift? Yes, it is. What is really a gift in our context here, what we're talking about? Eternal life in heaven is a gift. It is free. Why is it free? Shouldn't somebody pay for it? Yes. Jesus paid for it. A price had to be paid to purchase our salvation. The good news is Jesus did that for you and me. Okay, if I could illustrate, if this hand were to represent you and me, and my wallet here represents our sin, we're all sinners. The Bible tells us, though, God loves us. God hates our sin, but he loves us. See, sin separates us from him. You can't go to heaven with even one sin. Do we get that? Not even one. Well, who's disqualified then? Everybody. Everybody's in the same boat. And the Bible says if you die with your sin, you spend forever separated from God in a real hell. Okay? God doesn't want that for anybody. And so what he did was he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. You see, most people think, oh, well, I don't want to go there, therefore I will... I will, uh, I'll behave myself. I'll go to church every week. I'll give money. I'll get baptized. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll, I'll reform my life. I'll turn from my sins. I'll be sorry for my sins. And all of that thinking that that some way is going to take away the sin. It won't take away the sin. Death is the only payment. Death is the only payment. You're going to either, you're going to either have to die yourself and spend forever separated from God or accept the death payment God provided for you, which he will accept. And that's what Jesus did, this hand representing him. Sinless, God himself. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin upon himself. He made the payment so we don't have to. He paid the price so we would not have to and came back from the dead. And the Bible tells us that if you will put your faith in him, if you'll trust in him, he will save you by his grace it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You mean it's, a, it's, it's really, it's a gift? Yes, it's a gift. He's offering that. You know, if my Bible was eternal life, okay, and I, and, 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 and I said, okay, you, you can have it. Okay, here's eternal life. You can have it as a gift, bought and paid for through the blood of Christ. Here, you can have it as a gift. You know, that can be offered to you, but it's not yours until you receive it. You have to take it. Did you know you can reject a gift? You can say, no, that's okay. Wait a minute. The only way you can spend forever with God is to accept the gift he provides. Through faith in Christ, you trust in Christ, he gives you the gift of eternal life. He'll never lose you. He'll never cast you out. You might say, well, what if I do awful things in my life? Well, what are those awful things called? Sin. How many of my sin did Jesus pay for on a cross? Paid for all of them. So then what sin is going to send me to hell if all my sins are gone? There are no sins to send me to hell. When you trust Christ the Savior, all your sins are forgiven, the Bible says. Now, you know, there's a lot of people who hear that, even so-called Christians, and they'll say, I can't accept that. 
Well, you better accept that. You better accept that because Jesus is the only way, and it's only through faith, okay? You can't accept what? That Jesus paid for all your sins? Well, you're calling him a liar because when he died on the cross, he said it's finished, paid in full. Friend, I urge you to trust Christ the Savior, okay? Now, once you trust Christ, the Bible says you're born again. You now become a, ch- a child of God. You might say, well, then what's, what's next? Well, you're saved forever no matter what, but does God have a plan for your life? Yes, he does. He has a plan for your life, okay? And that's found in verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship, his product, the thing made, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, see right there, it says you have to do good works. Now, wait a minute. It doesn't say you have to do good works. Where does it say in verse 10, you have to do good works? It says you're created unto good works. In other words, God has a plan. Once we've trusted Christ the Savior, God, yes, he wants us to live a life of good works, but not to get to heaven, not to stay going to heaven. It's because we're saved and now God has a life for us to live. There's a big difference between the two. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We should. It doesn't say we will or we must. It says we should. And that is the truth. Okay? Now, go back to 1 Thessalonians. This was a reality in the life of these people. Okay? This church had been founded... It's been in existence about one to two years, and these people were on fire for Christ. They were were saved, and and Paul believed they were saved and recognized their salvation by what? The message that they preached and the lives that they lived. That is exactly the way it should be with us. Somebody should be able to look at me and say, that person's a Christian, Now, do they know that for sure? No, they can't really know that 100% for sure. But humanly speaking, as humanly possible as possible, they ought to be able to look at me and say, that person is a Christian. Why do you say that? Because they believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and I see a reality in their life. That's proper. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, there's everything right with that. And that's what we see here in their lives. Verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. The word preached to them by those who not only preached, the word, excuse me, the word was preached to them not only by those who, who uh, preached the word of God, but with Paul's company, those who went with them, they also lived it. Okay? There was something undeniable about the lives that Paul and his company were living. The life of Paul and his companions was powerful. And folks, this is a double power that God wants in every life of every believer. Not only should we be speaking the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, but we also should be living by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, here's the, here's the truth of it. A life that is submitted to the Holy Spirit and under his control will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. That's a supernatural kind of life. Here's the point. People cannot argue with a changed life that backs up the truth of the gospel. Okay? In other words, Jesus saves me. He saves me from hell. He saves me from sin. Well, then my life should manifest the fact that I have that salvation that God offers as a gift. When we are right with the Lord, we won't hinder the Holy Spirit using his word on others. So through me, okay, I preach the gospel But through me, I should also let the Holy Spirit work and use my life for the furtherance of his kingdom. My message is salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The life I live should manifest the fact that he is the God of my salvation. He is the one who delivers me, not only from the 
penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin as a believer. Now, the Thessalonians, even though they were young in Christ, they had five qualities that grew out of the fact that they had trusted Christ as Savior. And we should have the same qualities. Now, to the extent that we cooperate with God, we will have these things. But if we don't cooperate with God as believers, we won't have these things. But make no mistake about it, these things are the will of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6. It says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Number one, they became, the Thessalonian believers, became followers of Paul, his fellow workers, and most importantly, they became followers of the Lord. Now, this is an interesting word because the word follow here literally means imitators, imitators. This is very practical and down to earth. You know, it's amazing to me. uh, People get saved and then they wonder, well, how should I be? How should I live? Okay? And so what do they do? Well, you know, we can say, well, you know, if you want to know how to live, read the Bible. Get in there, read the Bible. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm for that. It's great. Yes, you should do that. But you know what, folks? It's one thing to tell somebody to read the Bible, but what they are looking for along with that, because that's going to take an awful long time. You know what they want? They want to be looking for somebody. uh, Let's see. Who else has believed this message? Let, Let me see how I'm supposed to be. Now, you know, you can get super spiritual, pseudo-spiritual, and you say, no, shouldn't look at us. We're just sinners. Shouldn't look at us, you know. I mean, don't forget, I got the bumper st- sticker, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Well, that's true, but are you using that as an excuse to live a carnal life? If we are saved, people are looking at us. Listen, if I am proclaiming the gospel, it's like I've stood up with a, a, a red flag saying, here I am, here I am. And people say, that person, they're a Christian. Okay. You know what's amazing to me? A lot of lost people have a better idea how Christians should live than Christians do. They became followers of Paul, his fellow workers, and most importantly, the Lord. This is so practical and down to earth. They followed Paul and his company, and as they did, they followed the Lord. A true servant of God, as he follows the Lord, he's going to bring those who follow him to the Lord. It's just normal. 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says this, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now, think about that for a moment. It's in the Bible. It's inspired by God. Okay? See, our tendency is to say, oh, no, 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 don't follow me. Follow the Lord. Well, yes, follow the Lord. But guess what? I'm supposed to be following the Lord with my life. Let me ask you this. Are you going to tell that to your kids? It's not going to make any sense to your children. Don't follow me, follow Jesus. Well, they can't see Jesus, but they can see you. Let's not expect more out of people than is realistic. Okay? That's why, by the way, there are requirements for church leadership. And they have to do with the first one is uh, a, a bishop must be blameless. Blameless. That is the overriding quality in the life of church leadership. You know what that means? That means you can't throw anything at that person and have it stick. Now, I didn't say you can't throw anything at the person. By the way, I don't mean physical objects. That's why we have a pulpit, something to duck behind. (laughs) What I'm saying is every accusation should be a false one, right? Right? That's why you don't receive an accusation against an elder except in two or three witnesses, okay? Now listen, here's the point. We should be living a godly life. And I don't have to worry about people following me if I'm following Christ. 
It's those who say usually, oh, don't follow me, don't follow me, don't follow me. Because they want to go in a bad direction with their lives. No, friends, we ought to be as believers following the Lord. Paul said, listen, he was either very arrogant or confident that he was going to live a committed life for Christ. Because he said, follow me. Be followers of me. Philippians 3.17, brethren, be followers together of me. The Thessalonians took it seriously, and they became followers of Paul, his fellow workers, and followers of the Lord. Secondly, we see it in verse 7. It says, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And samples is, our, is the old word for examples. Okay, number two, they became examples to all believers. Wait a minute. These are new Christians. They haven't been saved very long. And yet they were living a life of an example of what a Christian should be. By the way, that blows out, out of the water. Any idea that, well, you know, no one should expect anything until I'm, you know, more mature in Christ. Why? Why? When do you expect a candle to give light? When you first light it or once it's halfway gone? No, a candle gives light as soon as you light it. As soon as we're saved, we are giving off light. At least we should be. Okay? They became examples to all believers as they followed the Lord. They then became active in preaching and teaching. It is always the biblical pattern. It's always the biblical plan. It is God's will. It is God's will for me. Dear friend, if you're saved, it is God's will for you. Okay? We are either part of the solution or we are part of the problem. God wants us all to be part of the solution. That is the beauty, by the way, of the local church. The local church is a place that we can not only learn from the scriptures how we're supposed to be, if it's a godly church, we can learn from each other how we're supposed to be. And that is not unspiritual. It is, in fact, very spiritual because that is the way it's supposed to be, and that's what we see in Scripture. And then, by the way, if you don't believe that, you need to go back and examine the Word of God, the emphasis on how we are supposed to be examples. 2 Timothy 1, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says to Timothy, Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus... And then in verse 2 he says, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall, who shall be able to teach others also. Look at that multi-level idea. Now, <clears throat> let me say this. I'm for Bible college. I'm good with that. But some of you will never go to Bible college. Does that make you some sort of a second-class Christian? Absolutely not. All Christians are first-class. All Christians, okay? Here's the truth of it. God simply wants us to learn and then apply and then live what he has given us. And guess what? You are going to be used by God beyond your wildest imagination. God can use you. If you've trusted Christ, there's a ministry for you. You might say, oh, no, I'm, I'm a nobody. Well, that's true. All of us are nobodies. But with Jesus Christ, we're all somebody. Okay? And God has a ministry for you. You might say, well, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm what, it, you know, I don't have this, I don't have that, and all, all the reasons. No, God has a ministry. How do you know God has a ministry for, for me? It's easy. You still alive? Well, yeah, God is a ministry for you. He'll take you when he's done. But if he hasn't taken you, you're not done yet. So let your light shine. Let me ask you a question. We all need to ask ourselves this. What would be accomplished for Christ in this world if everyone was like me? Okay? What would be accomplished for Christ in this world if everyone was like me? Be honest about that. Okay? 
Listen, go ahead and let that one haunt you today. You can quit thinking about it at the end of the day. You can keep thinking about it too, but let's think about what would be accomplished for Christ in this world if everyone was like me. You know, we kind of, we take the passage in, in uh, Isaiah and we like kind of rewrite it where it says, here my Lord, send me. A lot of us will say, here my Lord, send him. <laughs> here my Lord, send her. No, here my Lord, send me, me. What would be accomplished for Christ in this world if everyone was like me. Verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Now this verse, we don't have time to just sit here with this verse today and spend 30 minutes on it. But you know what? I wish we did have the time. I want you to notice something here, and I want you to understand the power that is in 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. These are, remember the context these people have been saved a year and a half, maybe two years. That's it. That's it. Hadn't been to Bible college. Hadn't taken special night courses. They haven't been online. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, these are regions, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. Watch this. This is Paul speaking. So that we need not to speak anything. What's it saying? <laughs> it's saying this. These people got saved and they were lit on fire spiritually and they ran with it. And they were faithful, and they were faithful in evangelizing, and they were faithful in encouraging believers, and they were faith. And, and, and Paul's team, you know, he hears about this, and it's like, okay, we've got people that are going out and, and going and talking to people, and people will say, oh, I've already heard that. Where, where'd you hear that? Our, from Joe Blow from the Thessalonica church. He told me about Jesus. And they go someplace else, maybe at work, and they'd be working. And say, well, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Oh, I know about Jesus Christ. How do you know about Jesus Christ? Well, somebody talked to me about it. Who was it? Well, Joe Schlobotnik. Or, or, or he, who's he from? Oh, he, he goes to that church in Thessalonica. Do you get the picture? Everywhere they went, people had already heard. Mike. Well, boy, these are super Christians. No. They're simple sinners saved by grace who are submitted to the Lord in their lives. They hadn't been saved long, folks. They hadn't been saved long. But what could be accomplished? See, it's not a matter of skill. It's a matter of availability. It really is. They became, number three, they became faithful witnesses for Christ. They were so faithful that they were incredibly thorough. And by the way, you know what that also points to, even though it's not one of the major teachings of that text, but it's in there if you look at it. This must point to the fact that they believe anybody can be saved. Why? Because they witness to everybody. Verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Number four, they turn from their false gods to serve the one true God in verse 9. Okay? Now, now l l let me say this. People say, well, see that? What they had to do to be saved? No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Verse 9 does not say what they had to do to be saved. Verse 9 says what happened in their lives once they trusted Christ as Savior and they started growing. There's a big difference between the two. Verse 9 doesn't talk about how they got saved. Verse 9 talks about once they started following the Lord, what happened. In other words, what constituted them following the Lord. And it's very proper today. 
See, many times in early New Testament times, idols and false gods were statues of one kind or another. Today, while that's still possible, our idols are different things, such as celebrities, okay? Movie stars, money, fame, material possessions, desires of the flesh, The life of somebody who's going to follow the Lord as we should is somebody who says, you know what, all the idols of the world, I'm going to turn from those idols to serve the living and true God. There's nothing wrong with that. Because the idols of this world are going in one direction and the Lord is going in another direction. You're not going to follow him unless you turn to him from those idols. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of the Christian life. Very, very important. The believer who is following the Lord will move towards purity and godliness in his life if you're following the Lord. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I'm saved, I'm free, I can't be lost, I'm on my way to heaven. There's not one thing that could send me to hell because all my sins are gone. So then what should I do with my freedom? I should not live unto myself. I should use my liberty not as a, as a base of operations for, for my flesh, which by the way, that's what the word occasion means, a base of operations. It's a military term. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty as an, as an opportunity for the flesh, but by love serve. Or uh, not an opportunity, an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. I should use my liberty to serve other people. And as I do that, the things of this world, I leave them behind. And I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. It's the way I ought to live as a Christian. And we see the last one in verse 10. It says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Number five, they lived for Christ while looking for him to come back. Now you notice the five qualities here, and I'll say more about the last one in just a moment. Number one, they became followers of Paul his fellow workers, and most importantly, the Lord. Once they were saved, this is, what, this is the direction they went. Secondly, they became examples to all believers. We need to be examples to all believers. Third, they became faithful witnesses for Christ, so thorough that no one needed to say anything to anybody because the Thessalonians had already covered it. Number four, they turned from their false gods to serve the one true God in verse 9. And number five, they lived for Christ while looking for him to come back in verse 10. You notice what it says, and to wait for his son from heaven. That's present tense. Paul said, Paul didn't say, and you waited for a while for Jesus to come back, but you quit looking. No, to wait, to wait. To eagerly look with expectation is the idea. This points clearly to the fact that the rapture should be seen as an imminent, which mean, uh, in an imminent event, which means a pre-tribulational rapture. Okay? Remember, if something has to happen before the rapture, such as certain events during the tribulation period, which is yet future, then the rapture is not imminent. You'd be able to say, Well, okay, the rapture's coming. The rapture's coming. Well, when is the rapture going to take place? Well, after the Antichrist claims himself to be God and to be worshipped of God. Well, then the rapture's not imminent. What am I looking for? I wouldn't be looking for the rapture. I'd be looking for the Antichrist. Then I'd think, okay, the rapture's really close now. But that wasn't the message that was preached. The message that was preached was this. You need to be eagerly anticipating Jesus. If that's so, it's imminent. If that's so, it's pre-tribulational, because they knew the tribulation hadn't begun yet. This points clearly to a pre-trib rapture, all right? 
Let me show you another verse on this. Turn with me to Titus chapter 2. You're in Thessalonians. Go to Titus chapter 2. See, grace teaches us to look for Christ to come back. Did you know that? If you are going to let grace teach you, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking, there it is again, looking for the blessed hope, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming. He's coming. Now, let me ask you one more time today. What would be accomplished for Christ in this world if everyone was like me, was like you? We ought to be able to say, well, something's going to get done. I'm not perfect, but by the grace of God, I'm going to serve the Lord and bring other people to Christ. By the grace of God, I'm going to have an impact on people's lives. By the grace of God, God's going to change my life, and people are going to see the difference. You know, pastor who was uh, our pastor for many years, Jack Weaver, who's with the Lord now, uh, he used to say this. I can remember we heard it many, 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 many times in his ministry. Now, he was sold out for the gospel, loved the gospel, loved to share it, but he also understood the importance of living a godly life as a believer. And he said many times, he says, there ought to be a visible difference of the invisible difference. Okay? There ought to be a visible difference of the invisible difference. Does that mean we have to be perfect before we share our faith? No. But as we are sharing our faith, we should be living lives that, that confirm the message that Jesus is the Savior, okay? People should see reality in our lives. To put it another way, our walk and our talk should be in harmony. Our walk and our talk, the way we live and the message we believe should be in harmony, okay? If, if I am not living for Christ with the way I live my life, if my walk is not godly, then when I open my mouth with the talk, Yes, there's power in the gospel, I get that. But you know what, folks? Many people won't listen because they'll say, well, I'm, he's just a fanatic, he's a nut. This is all he talks about. Look at his life. I don't see any, anything in his life. What does he have that I want? Because they don't see anything. But you know what? If all I have is a walk, oh, I live a godly testimony, I have a good life, I don't do this, I don't do that, I have good works, I'm, I'm a moral person and all that, but I never open my mouth with the gospel. What good is that? How are they going to get saved? Let me say this, no one will ever get saved by watching you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But plenty of people can get turned off to the believer Okay? who is not living a godly life. We need to have both, the walk and the talk. They ought to be in harmony. Today, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, okay, this truth of Christianity, okay, how are you saved? You're saved by believing, by putting your trust in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross and paid for your sins. When you trust in him as your Savior, he gives you eternal life. It's a gift. You can have that today. Okay? This issue about living a, a godly life, that doesn't get you to heaven. That brings God's blessings into your life after you're saved, but that won't get you to heaven. The only thing that gets you to heaven is what Christ did on the cross. Trust in him today. Would you do that? Let's all bow in prayer. <clears throat> As we close today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you trust in Him today as your Savior, right where you sit? Between you and God, you can get it settled. It's a gift. You're not making promises. Please don't confuse anything I've said today. Salvation going to heaven's a gift. It's free. Please, would you trust in Jesus Christ right now as your Savior? He paid for your sins. He offers you eternal life. You can have it. You can walk out of here knowing you're going to heaven. 
if you'll simply trust Christ. Get that settled between you and God right now. There's no formula prayers or anything like that. You can talk to the Lord. He knows your thoughts. Lord, Lord, I know. I know I'm a sinner. I understand today I can't save myself. I believe Jesus died for me. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ today to give me that gift of eternal life. I want the gift. Friend, he'll give it to you. No strings attached. No strings. If we never see you again, you can still go to heaven and we'll see you there. But please put your trust in Christ. Would you do that right now? Would you trust in him? Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if today is the first time that made sense to you, and today you trusted Christ the Savior, could I pray for you as we close? I won't embarrass you or call out your name. I won't have you stand up, anything like that. But I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for direction for your life now that you've trusted Christ. Is there anyone who would say, yes, today I understood it. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up put it down. Is there anyone? I won't embarrass you. Is there anyone? Slip it up, put it down. You don't have to raise your hand, but I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone? Now, Father, we ask you today to use your word. Use it in our lives. Help us ask the question, Lord, what would be accomplished in the world if every Christian was like me? It's so important, Father, that we understand this and and your will, that we would, uh, Father, Uh, cooperate with you and let you use us for your glory in this world in which we live. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for what you've given us today. Use it in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and God bless you.